Good evening. Good evening, my name is Jehanel Jabagi, and I serve as an associate professor of business law and ethics here at Georgia College and State University. It is my privilege to welcome you to this year's Supreme Court Review. This event will include an overview of the most recent Supreme Court term. We'll have our four guests, we have one that's running a little late, who will cover five cases, and then we'll have time for questions. We aim to conclude by 7.45 p.m. We hope that you stay to the end because we will have um, Chick-fil-A outside as you leave, uh, but you have to stay to the end. All right, so first I'd like to start with an overview of the court itself. So there are nine justices who sit on the court. In the center is our Chief Justice, John G. Roberts. To his left is the longest serving justice, Justice Thomas, he's from Georgia, and he has served for about 32 years. He was nominated to the court by George Herbert Walker Bush. To the Chief Justice, who's in the center's right, there's Justice Alito, who was nominated by George W. Bush, as was the Chief Justice. And then to the far left is Sonia Sotomayor, who was nominated by Obama, as was Justice Kagan, who is to the far right, seated. In the back, the people on the left were all nominated by Trump, starting with the tallest one. His name is Justice Gorsuch. To his right is Justice Kavanaugh. And to the far left is Justice Amy Coney Barrett. Now, one notable uh, piece of news from the court is that it got a conservative supermajority when Justice Barrett was took or was nominated to replace Justice Ginsburg's seat. So that's one sort of notable um, aspect of the current court. Another interesting fact about the court is that the newest justice, who is Katanji um, Brown, she, even though she's the newest justice, she was the most active justice during oral arguments. So when people argue before the Supreme Court, the justices can ask them questions, and Justice Brown asked, took up the most time or asked the most questions, other than the Chief Justice, and that was probably on procedural grounds. Now, because there are nine justices, in order for there to be a majority opinion, you have to have at least five justices join the opinion. This shows you the last seven years of how the court broke down. So the white bar that you see in each uh, column reflects five to four decisions. And then the black bar shows uh, decisions that were unanimous, when all nine justices were in agreement. So you can see over the last seven years there's been a decline in unanimous decisions. Last year had the fewest unanimous decisions in um, 20 years. And so we've had actually an increase in this last term of unanimous opinion. So more justices agreeing in the substance of the cases. Last year, we had the highest number of 6-3 decisions uh, since this data has been collected. So when I mentioned uh, Judge Amy Coney Barrett um, cemented sort of a conservative supermajority, that last year with those 6-3 decisions was notable. Uh, however, those 6-3 decisions have declined this year. Uh, another interesting fact about the 6-3 splits is that last year there were 14 of those cases that were 6-3 divided on ideological grounds. They were completely polarized, which means the six Republican-nominated justices all agreed and the three Democratic-nominated justices agreed. Now that has declined to only five in this last year, so there's less of this ideological split on this current court. This is a chart that shows you how often each justice was in the majority. And so last year it was pretty notable in that the Democrat appointed justices were not often in the majority or they're the least likely to be in the majority. But that has equaled out more this term and so we're seeing more um, sort of more evenness across all the justices in terms of being in the majority. This is showing you how often the justices are in agreement. So the justices mostly in agreement are Sonia Sotomayor and Judge Brown, and also Sotomayor and Kagan. And then you can also see Justice, the Chief Justice, John Roberts and um, Kavanaugh are most often in agreement. Now I want you to see if you can see the ones most in disagreement. Can you see that on the chart? Anyone tell me what it is? Who are the two people most in disagreement? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, Kagan, actually in Alito, most in disagreement. So the, the two justices least likely to agree are Kagan and Alito. So that gives you a little overview of some interesting trends with the Supreme Court. Now I'm going to ask you to get out your phones and we're going to do a massive cahoot. All right. See what you know. And there are stakes. All right, start. So while you're, let me go to classic mode here. And there's no limit on the number of players, so don't worry about being the first. Here we go. So please let the name be clean. We have presenters here today that hail from all across Georgia, so let's make Georgia College proud. So you could win a tumbler, water tumbler, that has all the College of Business majors on it. There's also post-it notes. And a very tiny planter for your succulents. No, I don't know. So there's also this as a prize. I'm gonna give you 60 more seconds to get in there. I think we have about 150 people in here. We got 140 in this game. Five, four, three, two. Good to see you. One. All right, let's go. You will only have five seconds to answer. How many justices serve on the Supreme Court? Please let this be 100%. Oh, to the seven of you. No, nine. Okay, there's nine, nine people. You see what you're working with. All right, who was the most active member of the court during oral arguments other than the Chief Justice? I see I was not very memorable. About how many cases did the Supreme Court decide in 20, it should say 2022. I didn't tell you, so let's see who could just guess this. All right, they had 58 cases that they decided in this last year. The average of the last 20 years has been 75, so they actually have been deciding fewer cases than on average. Uh -oh. All right, winged finch 96, you're in the lead. <laughs> what is the name of the Chief Justice? John Roberts. Oh, now it's Dara. All right, we just have four more questions left. This is a specific case question. In Sackett versus EPA, the court addressed what particular environmental law? Is the Clean Water Act. <laughs> Next case question, in Jack Daniels versus VIP Products, what item was at issue? Was it a knockoff bottle of whiskey, a yo-yo, a dog shoe toy, or a chess set? In 303 Creative versus Alanis, it pitted the First Amendment against what legal concept? Oh, people seem to have some knowledge of this one. All right, we only have two more questions at play for these prizes. This is the Twitter and the Google cases. Plaintiffs sought to hold companies responsible for what? Aiding and abetting terrorism. G 
James, you're in the lead. Who's James? You're going to own it. There's a prize. Nah. <laughs> oh, dinnered. You got to put dinnered. How excited are you about? This is a, oh, you got to be fast. All right. This is everyone's a winner on that one. All right. Let's see who won. And whoever won this has to come get your prize. All right, G, congratulations, you're third. Dallas, number two. And? James. All right, we're getting serious now, so let's close this out. We are now getting to the substance of our program. Our first guest is a lifelong resident of Columbus. Ben Land graduated summa cum laude from the University of Georgia in 1989. He graduated summa cum laude as well from the University of Georgia School of Law in 1992, finishing second in his class. While in law school, he served on the editorial board of the Georgia Law Review, clerked for the Georgia Supreme Court, and was elected to the Order of the Quaff. Following law school, Ben had a private law practice in Columbus, focusing on civil litigation and trial practice. During his nearly 20, maybe more years, 20, 25-ish year career as a private practice attorney, he obtained several record-setting jury verdicts on behalf of individuals injured at the hands of others, and he also played a key role in the defense of numerous nationwide class action lawsuits. Outside of the practice of law, he served as a board member for the Columbus Area Habitat for Humanity, a volunteer and board member for the Pine Mountain Trail Association, and a youth sports coach. He and his wife and their three children are active members of the St. Paul United Methodist Church. After being appointed by Governor Nathan Deal, Judge Land left the, practice, uh, the private practice of law and became a superior court judge in 2018. In 2020, the voters of the Chattahoochee Judicial Circuit elected him to continue serving in this role. Judge Land was appointed to, by Governor Brian Kemp to, to the Georgia Court of Appeals and was sworn in on July 20th, 2022. Judge Land will discuss our first case this evening. Judge Land, welcome. Thank you for that introduction, Professor, and thank you for putting together this Constitution Week program. Thank you to all of the attendees. I know some of you, maybe many of you, may have been required to be here, but thank you nonetheless for being here. Nothing like a promise of free food, especially when it's from Chick-fil-A, to help the attendants. But in all seriousness, I do want to thank you all for being here. I do want to thank you all for taking time out of your day to celebrate the Constitution, uh, the greatest document in our government's uh, history, the document that is the foundation for our great nation. And it's a document that many Americans take for granted and hardly ever think about. But it's nice once a year to at least pause and reflect on the Constitution and all that our founding fathers did to make America what it is. So thank you all for being part of that. Thank you all for being here and, and listening, and thank you for your attention. Uh, my job tonight is to talk to you about one case that the U.S. Supreme Court, these nine judges that are on this screen, uh, decided in 2023. The case is Sackett against the EPA, Michael and Chantel Sackett, basically against the federal government. And before I launch into what the case is about, I just want to pause for a minute and tell you my takeaway from the case from a 30,000-foot perspective. Uh, what is the case about? I mean, we can talk about the facts. We can talk about the details. We can talk about how the judges get involved in very detailed, minute statutory construction. But I want to back up from that because I know we've got a room full of college students. I know many of you are either in business law or political science classes. Many of you may be interested in a career in the law one day, and if you're not, uh, you're, you're having to learn the law right now for your classes. So what is the case 
represent, what it is an example of. It is an example of several things. It's an example of how the legal system works. It's an example of how individuals, in this case a married couple, Chantel and Michael Sackett, could hire a lawyer and go to court and take on the ultimate Goliath, the United States of America, and win not just once in the United States Supreme Court, but twice in the United States Supreme Court. That's virtually unheard of. Uh, it's an example of the power of our legal system to do good for ordinary people. It's an example of the legal system being the great equalizer uh, and the example of a courtroom being a place where there is a level playing field no matter how powerful or otherwise powerless you feel. In a courtroom, whether it's here in Milledgeville, up the road in Atlanta, across the state to my hometown in Columbus, or out in Idaho where the Sackett's litigation was, the courtroom really is the great equalizer. It's the place where ordinary people can go and present their cases to either judges or juries and achieve that noble ideal of justice that our Constitution protects. And that's really what the way I see this case, and that's really the way that I, if I'm going to leave you with any impression, that's the impression I want to leave you with, that this justice system that we work in and that you're a part of as an American really has the ability to do good for ordinary people. And that's what happened in the case of Sackett against the EPA. Michael and Chantel Sackett bought a piece of property, a small residential lot in northern Idaho, not far from the Canadian border, near a lake known as Priest Lake. As I understand the facts of the case, they were across the street, not just from the lake, but they were across the street from what the EPA classified as a tributary and what one of the justices called in the opinion a ditch, a drainage ditch um, that ultimately fed down into Priest Lake. So they're there in northern Idaho. Their desire is to build their dream home in northern Idaho, so they start preparing the lot for construction. They do backfilling of that lot, which essentially is moving dirt and rocks on the lot to make it ready for construction of their home. The EPA finds out about this, and the EPA decides they're in violation of the Clean Water Act because they are disturbing the soil, they're moving rocks and dirt, and they're in protected wetlands near the lake and near this ditch that is across the street. The EPA, with all the power of the federal government, says you can't do this. You have to restore the property to the condition it was in, and you have to stop your construction. And if you don't do that, you're going to be liable for civil and criminal penalties exceeding four, up to $40,000 per day. Pretty strong penalties. The Sacketts didn't understand this. They didn't think it was right. They went to a lawyer. They filed a lawsuit under the Administrative Procedures Act to declare that the EPA was wrong, that the EPA had exceeded their authority and their property was not in wetlands, protected wetlands. The case got dismissed by the trial judge in Idaho. That dismissal was affirmed by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Sacketts went to the U.S. Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said the dismissal should be vacated. The Sacketts should have their day in court. They went back to court. The trial judge granted summary judgment in favor of the EPA because the EPA's regulations were so broad at protecting wetlands that they said it clearly applied. The district court ruled in favor of the EPA. The Ninth Circuit ruled in favor of the EPA. The Ninth Circuit is just a court of appeals that's above the trial court and below the Supreme Court. The Sacketts went to the U.S. Supreme Court again, and they got the case reversed again. And the U.S. Supreme Court, ultimately all nine justices for different reasons, held that the Sackett's lot did not constitute protected waters of the United States under the Clean Water Act. It did not constitute protected wetlands under the Clean Water Act. And the EPA had no authority or jurisdiction over them.
That is a remarkable achievement on behalf of two ordinary citizens against the United States government. The ultimate holding of the Supreme Court, the majority of the Supreme Court, is that our Clean Water Act is designed to protect waters of the United States. That's what the statute says, a somewhat vague term that requires elaboration. And for years, the EPA had put broad definitions on that term. The U.S. Supreme Court finally in this case said, well, I'll tell you what waters of the United States means. It means those bodies of water that we typically refer to as streams, rivers, lakes, or oceans. And it does include wetlands that are indistinguishable from those large bodies of water because they're right next to them. They have a surface connection between the wetland and the water. And they're going to be considered parts of those protected waters as well. What it does not include is a lot, a residential lot across the street from a ditch that flows into one of those lakes. And so they've adopted this bright line rule that in order to be a protected wetland under the Clean Water Act, it's got to be connected to one of these bodies of water. The Sackett's property was not. The EPA had no authority over them. So the Clean Water Act did not apply. And they were entitled after, I think, nine or 10 years, maybe longer, of litigation to build their house if they still wanted to build their house. Uh, that does point to one problem with our legal system is that things go slowly. They tend to go slowly. Some people give up. But it points to a greater strength, in my mind, of what our legal system is all about. And what good lawyers do, not just for their clients, but for society. Because with lawyers who are willing to fight the good fight for the reasons that they believe in, pursuing justice under the law, they can get justice for their clients. They can set precedents like they've said in this case. And so the next person or persons who want to build their dream home across the street from a ditch should not have to worry about the federal government coming in and saying you can't do that. Now, what does this case not mean? Does it, does it mean that the, the state of Idaho can't do anything to them? No, it doesn't mean that. Uh, the case goes into great discussion, great depth of discussion about how the protection of our waters prior to the Clean Water Act was primarily the responsibility of the states. And the states are free if they choose to impose regulations on people like the Sacketts, if they wish and if they have good reason to do so. So the state of Idaho could technically enact a statute that would control this. Congress, if they wish, could come in and amend the Clean Water Act and broaden it perhaps to cover the Sacketts. But the point is they didn't. The Supreme Court interpreted the law as written and said it doesn't apply to these folks. So my takeaway from the case is, yeah, it's a, it's a really significant case in the field of environmental policy. But for somebody like me who doesn't deal with environmental policy very often, it really represents the power of the judiciary, the power of the legal system, and the good that lawyers do for ordinary people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge Lynn. Our next speaker this evening is a good friend, a former co-worker of mine. Um, I want to make sure I pull up his information. There we go. Matt Ressing. Professor Ressing holds a bachelor's in English from Williams College, which is a private liberal arts college in Massachusetts, and a JD from the College of William and Mary, where he was articles editor for the Bill of Rights Journal. After law school, he worked in the Washington, D.C. office of Arnold and Porter, representing a wide range of clients, from individuals to Fortune 500 companies. He has represented clients before various state and federal courts in investigations by U.S. regulatory agencies and in international arbitration. He began his teaching career at Georgia College and State University, and in 2017, he joined the faculty at the University of Georgia, where he serves as a senior lecturer in legal studies in the Terry College of Business. He was also named as a master teacher by the Academy of Legal Studies and Business. He runs his own law firm here in Milledgeville, where he represents local business owners and serves on the board of the Chamber of Commerce. 
An avid Supreme Court watcher, Professor Ressing has discussed his decisions on Georgia Public Broadcasting, Macon's Law Call, and Georgia College's WRGC. He will discuss perhaps one of the most entertaining cases covered by the Supreme Court recently, Jack Daniels Properties versus VIP Products. Professor Ressing. Is this the clicker? Will this advance it? Vice President Mill. All right, hello. This is the case of Jack Daniels Properties versus VIP Products. And make sure I'm doing this right. There we go, I'll use the keyboard. Justice Kagan wrote the majority opinion, which starts off, this case is about dog toys and whiskey, two items seldom appearing in the same sentence. Not true, this is basically my grocery list. I have three dogs and stress. <laughs> so if you are in the market for an alcohol adjacent dog toy, you have plenty of options. These are Silly Squeakers, which is a brand owned by the defendant VIP Products. And they're silly because it looks like your dog is chewing on a liquor bottle. The VIP products, they copied many different bottle designs, but only one company sued. You know what it is, Jack Daniels. On the left is Jack Daniels. On the right is Bad Spaniels. And instead of old number seven, the Spaniel has taken the old number two on your Tennessee carpet. Just to drive this point home, if you look at the bottom in the tiny print, it says 43% poo by volume and 100% smelly. Jack Daniels was very well represented in this case. This is Lisa Blatt. I used to work with Lisa in Washington, DC, and she's one of the top Supreme Court advocates operating today. This was the first line of her oral argument. This case involves a dog toy that copies Jack Daniels' trademark and trade dress and associates its whiskey with dog poop. Now that's the way you frame an issue for the court. This is not about dog toys, it's about dog shit. <laughs> Jack Daniels has registered trademarks on many of the words on their bottle. They also have protection for the bottle's general appearance. We call that trade dress protection. And this is one of their records that I pulled from the US Patent and Trademark Office, also known as the USPTO. The USPTO enforces the Lanham Act, and this is the main federal law for trademarks and trade dress. There are two cardinal sins under the Lanham Act. You can't confuse customers by branding your product similar to a already trademarked brand. And you can't dilute a trademark by using it in a way that harms the association the trademark owner is trying to make with the public, in the public's mind. But dilution only applies to famous marks. So how do you know if a brand is famous? Well, let's check. Got some props here. I am going to hold up one of the dog toys, and on three, I want you to shout out if you think you know what alcoholic beverage it is supposed to look like. So, one, two, three. Hula. All right. That's, that's actually cat hula. All right, we have uh, one, two, three. Yes, no, this is bark party. I got, okay, one more. One, two, three. Yeah, it's Doggy Walker. So we've got some scotch here. And then uh, this is the little guy that caused all the trouble right here, the bad spaniel. Judge, do you mind if I uh, put some things over here? No pictures. <laughs> all right. So what have we established? Y'all drink too much, that's what we figured out today. But these are famous brands, instantly recognizable. Now, Jack Daniels is not the first company to get mad at this type of thing. Tommy Hilfiger, famous designer, they raised the stink when their cologne was copied by Timmy Holdigger, a fine pet cologne. A judge in the Southern District of New York did not find, find this, uh, this lawsuit uh, very humorous. He said, you know, Tommy, get over it. He threw this out on summary judgment. And he said that any consumer that got confused by this was dense and humorless. On the left is Louis Vuitton. On the right is Chewy Vuitton. This lawsuit was also thrown out. And, and as you can see, there's not a whole lot of likelihood of confusion. It's not likely that consumers are going to think that is made by Louis Vuitton. The parody is lighthearted. I think that also trademark owners like Louis Vuitton are gonna have a hard time saying this tarnishes their brand. But what about when the joke involves dogs going to the bathroom? 
As Judge Judy might say, don't pee on my leg and say it's couture. So we have Bulldog Johnny. This is something I saw at a state fair. I was there with my kids, and it is on a porta potty. And I would guess that UGA would not be so pleased at their trademarks being used in this fashion. This is what we call tarnishment. UGA wants you to think of football, quality education, not porta potties when you see the G or the bulldog. So can they stop this or do they just have to lighten up? You've probably heard of Barbie. You've probably also heard of the song Barbie Girl. This is a famous case about tarnishment. Mattel sued the band Aqua, saying that the song was raunchy and it made Barbie sound like a sex object. They also sued Aqua for using their trademark color, Barbie Pink. Aqua pointed out in this lawsuit that Barbie was originally based on a sassy German cartoon hooker, which is a true story. The case ended with the judge telling the parties to chill. This is probably my favorite uh, you know, judicial advisement here. And chill they did. So if you watch the recent Mattel approved Barbie movie all the way to the credits, they not only played the song Barbie Girl, but they played a remix of it featuring the famous rappers Nicki Minaj and Ice Spice. These women also recorded a music video with a lot of Barbie imagery. And if you know these rappers, you might not be surprised to learn that their song is much, much raunchier than the Aqua version. And if you're still in doubt about whether they are talking about the official Mattel Barbie, well, take a look, and there is the official trademarked B in glorious Barbie pink right on the front of their flying jet skis. I mean, wave runners. I mean, personal watercraft. Let's, let's say that. So did the US Supreme Court think that JD should just chill about the dog toys? And the answer is no. When it comes to using other people's trademarked or copyrighted work, we have a concept called fair use. And a lot of people have heard of fair use, but it's actually much more complicated than most people think. It's a fairly complicated four-part analysis. Simply commenting on something or claiming your work is done for parody, that may not be enough. But the Supreme Court had, uh, well, there's this test. It wasn't a Supreme Court test. It was actually a Second Circuit test. But a lot of other circuits have looked at it, too. It's called the Rogers test. It's from a case called Rogers v. Grimaldi, which dealt with the famous dancers Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. And the court in the Rogers case said that if it's a film, if it's a song, if it's a novel, if it's an expressive use that just happens to feature a trademarked work, we don't really care so much about those Lanham Act factors. We're gonna relax it a little bit and use a different test and say, does it have artistic relevance? Is it not explicitly misleading? If so, it's okay, go ahead and use it. Famous example of the Rogers test is from the movie The Hangover Part Two. One of the uh, characters in it is talking about his Louis Vuitton bag and uh, it features a bag that, it might be Louis Vuitton, but it's probably a knockoff that they featured in the movie. Well, Louis Vuitton sued. They said, we don't want you using our bag in your movie, especially not in this context. And the judge said, you, ca you can't keep them from using a bag in a movie. Your trademark is not protected in that way. Mostly because this movie is not about Louis Vuitton. They're not trying to claim ownership of Louis Vuitton. It's just an aside in a creative way work. However, the fatal mistake of VIP products, according to the Supreme Court, is when it did this, when it had bad spaniel and the other trade dress of the bottle, it was using this as a source identifier of their own. So not only were they using the words bad spaniels, they actually trademarked this, and they wanted to keep any other companies from using bad spaniels you know, for anything else. And the Supreme Court said, that's where you went too far. This is being used as a source identifier, as a trademark in itself, and that takes it away from the protection that is granted under Rogers. So Rogers doesn't apply, and they sent it back to the lower court to determine whether it was fair use. And we know that it probably wasn't, because the trial court had already ruled on that issue in an earlier part of the case. So it is very likely that Jack Daniels will win on remand to the lower court. 
The implications of this decision remain to be seen, but one thing that we got out of it is you can't just always go for Rogers. You can't always say it's a parody, don't worry about it, it's going to be fine. Courts are going to look at this in more detail, and parodies that previously thought they had a powerful defense may not. So go out and get your Chewy Vuitton now. Speaking of Spaniels, it turns out that Justice Alito not only owned a Springer Spaniel, he gave it the power of judicial review. This is from a 2017 Wall Street Journal article that quoted Alito as saying he would put the party's filings on his floor and then see which one the dog went to, and that's how he would rule. Is this, is this how you do it? <laughs> well, now that we know how the Supreme Court, at least, decides its cases, I think it is time we update this famous principle of law. This is from Marbury v. Madison, dated 1803, which is also the same year that Milledgeville was founded. Very famous words, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. There, I fixed it. Thank you, Georgia College. See, the Supreme Court is not dry. Plenty of excitement to be had. Our next speaker had to suffer Atlanta traffic. She is a native of rural Dodge County in middle Georgia. Jen Jordan graduated magna cum laude from both Georgia Southern University and University of Georgia School of Law. After beginning her career as a clerk for United States District Court Judge Anthony Alamo in Brunswick, uh, Jen moved to Atlanta, where she practiced law for over 20 years. Consistently recognized as one of the top attorneys in the state, Jen specializes in complex civil cases. Her work in the courtroom on behalf of Georgia consumers has resulted in multiple successful verdicts and reported appellate decisions, most notably representing consumers in multiple class action lawsuits against predatory payday lending lenders. From 2017 to 2022, she represented Georgia's 66th, sorry, just 6th, Senate District, which encompasses large parts of Fulton and Cobb counties. In 2022, she was Georgia's Democratic nominee for Attorney General. Actively involved in electoral politics and issue advocacy, Jen maintains a broad network of political contacts, both in Georgia and across the country. She regularly serves as a political and legal commentator for outlets including the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, WABE, MSNBC, and CNN. She lives in Sandy Springs with her husband, two children and three dogs, and I love that you pronounce your last name Jordan, right? That's how the people in Monticello where I grew up, they're all Jordans, so I'm good there. She's going to discuss a case called 303 Creative versus Alanis. Well, I don't have any props and no alcohol either, so I think that's kind of bad for me. Y'all talking about Supreme Court cases is kind of hard because they are difficult. Um, and usually, especially with the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court that we have now, there have been so many changes, right, in terms of what is the law. Um, maybe one court a few years ago said the law is this, and then all of a sudden now the law is something different. And so it makes it much harder to actually talk about these cases in a way that makes sense. So I'm going to apologize kind of up front. And then, so let's talk about 303 Creative LLC. And so basically, you should always ask, who are the parties? What is the case about, right? Well, this case was brought by a woman named Lori Smith in Colorado. And what Lori Smith did is she had a business, which was 303 Creative LLC. Not very creative, but, you know, that's what she named it. And basically what she said her business is is she does websites. Um, and she creates these generally. She is a business. And under the law, businesses that offer their services and their goods for money um, to the public um, are subject to something called public accommodation laws. And public accommodation laws have been incredibly important in the history of our country. And I think probably kind of the best iteration that I saw in terms of talking about 
um, these types of laws was actually in, um, in the dissent with Justice Sotomayor. They actually go back to the Civil War and the Civil Rights Act of 1875. And part of the history is that uh, in right after the Civil War, the Supreme Court uh, basically sh they shut the law down, the Civil Rights Act down, and they say it's unconstitutional. Because of what the Supreme Court did in that court, that's what led to Jim Crow laws, okay? And so the Jim Crow laws are then what led to us then passing the Civil Rights Act in the 60s. So you can kind of see the back and forth. So it's, it seems like in the now, everything is just crazy, right? You're like, what is going on? Why are people deciding these decisions? But if you look at the history of our country, there really has been kind of this back and forth. And that's really what the Supreme Court is always dealing with, kind of this balancing of interests. So what are the interests here? So we got Lori Smith, right? She says, I'm a web designer. And you know what? I like gay people. I just don't like them to get married. And that's literally what it's all about. She says, I want to do wedding websites, but I don't want to do wedding websites for gay people who want to get married. And so when she first brought the case, she brought it as a free exercise case as well as a free speech case. Free exercise deals with religion, right? Sounds kind of religious to me what she's saying. But when the court took it up to the Supreme Court, they said, we're not going to deal with the religious issues. And one of the reasons why is it's really hard to make out a free exercise claim. So that we're just going to do this on free speech. But what was interesting about Lori's case is that there really aren't any facts because what Lori did is she brings the case before she's even decided or really opened up the business with respect to designing these wedding websites. She says to the court, she says, you know, this is what I want to do. It's what I want to do. So what I think is going to happen is I'm going to have a gay couple come to me. They're going to want me to do their wedding website. I'm going to say no. And then the state of Colorado is going to enforce their anti-discrimination law against me. And that's bad, right? So that was kind of, that's the case. It isn't complicated, it isn't crazy, it isn't back and forth in terms of the EPA, definitely it in Lanham Act and copyright, um, but that's kind of the gist of the case. And really what makes it interesting is the fact that there aren't any facts. And so those of you who have been taking this this class or listening to the different um, kind of Supreme Court cases or even cases period, there are things called standing. Does anybody know what standing is in a case? That means that you have a reason to be there, that you're not just asking somebody for their opinion or that you don't really have, what is it? You don't really have like a, uh, any skin in the game, right? You, you've actually, it's gonna impact you one way or the other. But with respect to Ms. Smith, Nothing had happened. And then down the line, we find out that really, um, we're not quite sure if, if, if this is a real case or not, or if it was put up by some folks who really wanted the Supreme Court to do exactly what it did. The problem with this is that you may have an issue in terms of gay marriage, but there is no limiting principle here. This is about speech. So what we're saying is maybe I don't want to do a website um, for people that are mixed race right? And I can say, well, this is, this is just what I want to do. Even though we've got Loving versus Virginia, even though we've outlawed miscegenation laws, there is no limiting principle to this case. So while you may not care about um, LGBTQ rights, you may, right? What you have to understand about the Supreme Court and why it's so important to understand what they're doing is that what they do will impact you in some way or somehow, whether we're talking about gender, whether we're talking about race, whether we're talking about who you want to love or who you want to marry, all of their decisions impact every person who sits in this auditorium. And while they may be thick and hard to read, you better kind of get to know them because at the end of the day, they will impact your lives. I think I'm out of time. So I appreciate it and I appreciate y'all being here. Thank you so much for that presentation.
Our final speaker, Stephen Bradley, received his undergraduate education cum laude at Emory University. While obtaining his law degree at the Cumberland School of Law, Bradley was honored to be the lead oralist for the moot court team and simultaneously presided on the mock trial and moot court boards. Bradley clerked for the late Honorable Edward S. Smith of the Federal Circuit Court. Bradley has been a public service in the Okmulgee Judicial Circuit for almost 30 years. He joined the district attorney's office in 1994. As an assistant district attorney, Bradley personally handled more than 12,000 felony cases. When Bradley became district attorney in 2015, he oversaw the expansion of victim services, including starting a circuit-wide domestic violence task force and opening the circuit's first child advocacy center, the Bright House. In 2020, Bradley was elected to the Superior Court bench where he serves as a Superior Court judge for the Okmulgee Judicial Circuit. He proudly serves the people of Morgan, Green, Jasper, Putnam, Jones, Wilkinson, Hancock, and our very own Baldwin County. He will discuss the companion cases of Twitter Incorporated and the Google cases. Judge Brown. Good evening. Take, take your time with that. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. All right. Cheers. All right. Um, Jahan has asked me to go last because the research tells us that at this stage, 42% of you are asleep. And I can add to that, we want you to get your rest, OK? This is a critically important case. I mean, I say that not because I find it to be fascinating, because it actually will be a critically important case. What you're gonna find is that, what am I doing wrong, Jahan? I had to use the keyboard. My two, my, you had to use, beautiful, I, I got it, I got it, thank you. Bing, 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 bing. Wonderful. All right, these are the companion cases of Twitter versus Tomna and Gonzalez versus Google. I think you guys may have heard of those services. The reason they're important is because people use them all the time, right? Everybody knows this. Let me start first with how we got here. The location is Istanbul. Everybody remembers Istanbul, Turkey. It is where Europe meets Asia across a beautiful stretch of water called the Bosporus. On the Bosporus, you'll see is a nightclub called Reina. Reina nightclub at the time this happened was one of the chicest, most interesting, most wealthy places on earth. On the night of December 31st, 2016, they of course had a very large party. This is gonna be New Year's Eve. At the time, this is probably one of the hippest places on earth to be. You need to go out and look at this if you have any interest whatsoever in large nightclubs. At the time, there were probably 600 people in this nightclub, and it's typically packed. Approximately 3 a.m. on New Year's Day, a man came in carrying a, uh, what is almost certainly a Kalashnikov. He fired uh, literally hundreds of rounds, then aimed them at people as they fled, as they dived off into the water, he would use stun grenades in order to reload. The Supreme Court opinion says there were 120 rounds fired. Turkish media says there were 300, two, three, two to three rounds collected, casings collected. The BBC reports 180. I'll take the middle number. 69 people were injured, 39 people were killed. The next day, ISIS claimed that a heroic soldier had committed this attack, this assault. He was on the run. This is the photo from a surveillance camera outside immediately before his entry, approximately 3 a.m. The individual's name is Abdul Qadir Masharapov. He was captured on the 17th after a massive manhunt he ultimately got sentenced to 40 life sentences plus 1,368 years to be served in a Turkish prison. Because of this assault, all of those people were killed. Amongst the dead was a man named Nawaz Alasaf. 
Alasoff is a Jordanian national. His family sued under the Anti-Terrorism Act of 1990. That law allows people to sue and have secondary civil liability for any time that there is an act of international terrorism that is supported by another individual. In 2016, this act was extended to the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, commonly called JASTA. The question before the court was, how far can you extend that? The common, excuse me, the complementary case involves Nohemi Gonzalez. She was a, a college student from California who was working, saved her pennies, to taking a dream trip to Paris. And she was in a restaurant when a coordinated set of attacks, also claimed by ISIS, bombed that restaurant and killed her. Her family sued Google. Now, these are not trials. They were actually motions to dismiss, every one of them. What everyone agreed was that these platforms make money because a truckload of folks use them and their advertisements are placed alongside of recruitment and support videos, uh, postings for ISIS. ISIS stands for Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. In case you're curious, this is one of the many side routes I went down. There are, according to Justice Thomas's opinion, 500 hours of content uploaded every minute, 1 billion hours of YouTube alone videos viewed every day. In case you're curious, that works out to 41.666 million years, excuse me, days, 114 years every day viewed. I know that's not interesting to you, but it was fascinating to me. That's a lot of daggum time. Now, the Communications Decency Act had Section 230. You say, why does this matter? In 1995, there was an opinion that came out of the state of New York that said that any time there is an internet site that posts anything, they become a publisher. Publishers have what's called strict liability for their content. The Communications Decency Act threw in Section 230 in order to immunize platforms from being publishers. Clearly, whenever you're talking about Twitter and Google, what are they now? They don't want to be publishers according to Section 230. They're not going to be publishers. As we all know, this is going to create the collision for Twitter, Google, and people trying to sue them for horrifying acts. What occurred was that the district court dismissed the plaintiff's case. They said you cannot sue Twitter just because somebody in ISIS made money off of Twitter, recruited an individual out of Twitter. The Ninth Circuit flipped that. The Supreme Court granted certiorari. That's your Supreme Court. Now, as we all know, the Supreme Court is at sixes and sevens, and they're disagreeing with one another. So they turned this set of opinions over to the justice who could bring the most people together, who could reach across the aisle. He's known as being the most centrist individual. That, of course, is Clarence Thomas. <laughs> justice Thomas wrote an opinion that was actually a unanimous opinion. All nine of them agreed on this topic. But now, I don't want you to think that they're overworked at the moment, all right? This is all the terms, not including the last one. The line is the low number that the Supreme Court has ever decided. 53 signed opinions. That was actually doing, during the war between the states in 1862. Now, as you'll see, during the COVID era, they got right back to 53. Last year, they did 66. This year, according to SCOTUS blog and the New York Times, they turned in 56 signed opinions and one per curium, 57. Now, hang on, just a second. They have four clerks, multiple assistants, one justice. How many are they writing? Five, six, or seven opinions per year. This bunch is not overworked. So you figure they're spending an awful lot of time on this particular opinion, right? Okay. 
This opinion is not based on a trial. What it really is based on is a set of agreements and assumptions. These two cases are not coincidental. They're all the same lawyers. They're all the same individuals involved, okay? And they come to this agreement that said, this was an act of international terrorism. ISIS has been identified as that. The only question is, was Twitter aiding and abetting? That's two things, knowingly and substantial assistance. Now, aiding and abetting is often called parties to the crime, accessories. They relied on common law. This is not a new conversation for anybody who's ever done tort work or criminal work. As long as there have been crimes, there have been people who help commit crimes. No big deal, right? The Supreme Court listed this as three questions. Folks, this is old stuff. It's actually boring. Why are they asking about whether or not Twitter and Google aided and abetted the international terrorist? The truth of the matter is, these are actually easily solved questions. Were they knowingly involved in an act of crime? Did they substantially assist? And the Supreme Court relied upon Halberstam. Halberstam is an old case in which uh, a guy was going out and he was bringing home gold and antiques and jewelry. And the woman he was bringing them home to got sued by the folks whose house got burglarized asking where our stuff is. This is the set of factors that have been used since 1983. And by the way, Justice Thomas relies on an opinion from 1790. Again, not new. They find this was too attenuated. These guys are just providing the same service they make to any other garden club all around the world. The reality is they're just transmitting information. And if we were going to follow the plaintiff's line, they said it would run roughshod over any tort law ever, ever used. The reality is they said Twitter didn't create this problem. They're providing the same service to everybody. Well, hang on just a second. You mean they're taking an article and making it available to the world. Doesn't that sound like a publisher? So the question then becomes, how does Section 230 play into this? The one thing they don't talk about is Section 230. Well, hang on just a second. Remember I told you, these cases were granted together. They were argued on consecutive days. Very, very, I will commend to you these arguments because they're incredibly good. They're long. They're five hours worth of argument between the two cases. Lots of really smart people asking really smart questions of one another. Incredibly well prepared. And if you question whether or not our Supreme Court is functioning at a high deliberate level, you need to go out and look at this. Listen to them. They're fabulous. Now, here's the question. What is the impact? We don't have any idea. And in fact, when they get to the Gonzalez case, which is only about 2.30, they said there is no claim to talk about. So what does this mean? Well, I'll tell you. The Supreme Court obviously sidestepped every question in front of them. The plaintiffs don't have any better indication. Justice Jackson wrote a long, or excuse me, a very short but potent concurrence in Tamna about this only applies to this set of facts. You can get there. You can sue these folks some other way. There's no indication of how one would do that if you had better facts. And I don't know how you're going to have better facts than these. And then on the flip side, Google, Twitter, all these other platforms don't have any safe harbors. They have no idea how in the world to insulate themselves. And Section 230, nobody touched it. Does that mean that there is more protection? Did they implicitly avoid it? These are very smart folks. I will tell you, I think this is the most fascinating case, not because it was a bland opinion about aiding and abetting, it's because it's fascinating. It is ripping hot because of what they didn't say. Thank you so much. We now have about 10 minutes for questions, and this is the mic for questions. And to the panelists, if you're going to answer a question, please pull a mic to you. That won't pick up everything on the table. So, yes, we have one question over here. Hi, thanks to you all for coming here and doing this excellent job. Question for Judge Bradley. That was an amazing presentation. Is there anything in federal statutes that might hook in liability for these aiders and abettors allegedly um, along the lines of criminal facilitation? They're essentially facilitating a crime? Let, let me make sure we're very clear. These cases are tort liability. 
And the reason I say that is because there's certainly some conversation about conspiracy. There is certainly some conversation about some criminal cases, but it's not going to apply here because it requires specific intent and proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And Justice Alito, during the, during the arguments, very quickly ran to the fact that I know we're talking about a lot of criminal cases and tort cases that run together, and our analysis was similar, but this is not about criminal work because that requires different set of facts. So. Questions? All right. Making me work for it. All right. Ron, Phil Gura, I'm going to call you out. I know who you are. I'd like to talk a little bit about Sackett. Um, you, you, uh, Judge Land, you spoke glowingly about Sackett as the Supreme Court doing, doing good and doing justice. Um, and I don't want to get into whether or not Sackett was rightly or wrongly decided, but could you talk a little bit about deference and uh, how Sackett and West Virginia versus EPA and that line of cases? Um, in, in other words, why is the Supreme Court's uh, wonderful bright line definition of wetlands better than the EPA's definition of wetlands given the fact that the E in EPA stands for the environment? Well, that's a great question. Let me get my microphone. That's a great question, and I guess my comments are not intended to be a glowing affirmation of the wisdom of the Supreme Court's decision in Sackett as much as it is an affirmation of the general broader principle that the courts are open to ordinary people in a classic David against Goliath situation. And the, the point that I was trying to make, particularly to these students, many of whom may be aspiring lawyers, is that in our society, it often seems like the little guy gets left out many, many times. And it often seems, even among some lawyers, that the little guy rarely has a voice. And the point that I'm trying to make is not necessarily about the legal uh, correctness of the decision or whether I agree with it or disagree with it, because believe me, I am all for the protection of the environment. The point I'm trying to make about it is that even little guys like the Sacketts in northern Idaho can achieve justice in a case against the United States of America. To me, that is what is remarkable about our, one of the many things that is remarkable about our justice system. It's one of the things that has motivated me for 30 years as a participant in our justice system. It's one of the things that drew me to this legal system is that we really do have high ideals that are put into practice every day in courts across the nation. And the causes of everybody, big, small, and everybody in between, are championed by lawyers. So that's the point that I'm trying to make. As far as the merits of the case and the wisdom of the decision, I do what all lower court judges do. I respect the authority of the higher courts, and I respect the decision-making process that those higher courts enter into. And I think the Supreme Court here felt like the EPA had engaged in what they thought was tremendous overreach. And those justices of the Supreme Court, all nine of them ultimately agreed the Sackett's property was not subject to the EPA jurisdiction, felt like the government simply went too far here, and it rejected the EPA's test for when property is subject to the uh, provisions of the Clean Water Act. Whether they got it right or got it wrong is subject to debate and subject to good faith debate. Obviously, the EPA and the federal government thought they got it way wrong. Uh, I guess the way I look at it is the way I've heard it described oftentimes in our court. Uh, just because we get the last word doesn't always mean we're right. We're human. Sometimes we get it wrong. Uh, but this U.S. Supreme Court ultimately gets the last word, and their word is the law of the land unless and until they change their minds. So I'll, I'll leave the debate about the wisdom of the decision, whether it was right or wrong, to others. But that's my comment about that. Yeah. 
Um, I was wondering what you all thought, this is for anybody on the panel, about RICO being used to prosecute President Trump as well as the protesters um, for, for Cop City, you know, obviously here in Atlanta and Fulton County. I'll go first and I'll take an easy out as a judge on the Court of Appeals who may, who may ultimately be called upon to review some of those matters. I have no comment. I'll say quickly, I think that the use of RICO in both cases really does illustrate just how broad Georgia's RICO statute is. So the state of Georgia has one of the broadest RICO statutes in the country um, and extends to just about anything you can think of. So, you know, the release of the Trump indictment from the grand jury, um, and then you turn around a week or two later and you have the, the protesters, right, in terms of Cop City, how that was released, and the indictment comes from the very same grand jury, just shows you that prosecutors with respect to their discretion and what they wanna go after um, can do a whole heck of a lot under Georgia's criminal RICO statute. Prosecutor's not gonna weigh in. Yeah, I, I wanna hear from Judge Bradley because he's a former, <laughs> former prosecutor, but- I, 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 I don't really know how to answer that. I don't know enough of the facts about either one of them underpinning it. I do agree with Ms. Jordan that uh, it, it's a broad spectrum of possible crimes that can be swept into a RICO indictment, but I don't know enough about those to comment about them intelligently, so sorry. We have there is a sense that if prosecutors have a tool, they're going to use it. Uh, and conspiracy, RICO, felony murder, these are all you know, gifts that the courts have given the prosecutors to make it easier to make their cases. One of the, the ironies in this is that Giuliani uh, who's now subject to these laws, he really used RICO a lot uh, when he was a prosecutor himself. So I think you can certainly debate the morality of these expansive uh, prosecutor-friendly rules, but they've been around for a while. I think it is fair game. We have time for one more question. Hi, I'm not a student. Um, <laughs> My question is that, um, in its opinion of, my opinion is, and it's to, to Matt Rossing, by the way, uh, my opinion on the justices having a job for life. And, you know, I, I don't think anybody should have a job for life. I, I have a job for life because I'm self-employed. And I can, you know, I'm still working, so uh, as long as I'm fit to do that, I will keep working. But in such an important job as being a justice of the Supreme Court, I mean, surely they must have a, t a term and not just for life. Thank you. I'll put in a plug for one of the other Constitution Week events that Jahan has planned. I believe this is tomorrow. They're gonna to be talking about the Supreme Court and there's really three things that have come up you know, over time, but, but also recently with the Supreme Court. One is, should justices be serving for life? Uh, the other is, is nine justices the right number of justices? And then the last one is, should the Supreme Court have an ethics code and what should that involve? So uh, there are many people questioning that as well, David. And just to, what's interesting in terms of the Georgia Supreme Court, which I know Judge Land knows, you really, and the Supreme Court says this, can't really regulate them. So what they've done in Georgia is they've actually, uh, there's a rule that says if you serve past a certain age, then you basically forfeit a lot of your retirement. And so you see a lot of judges on the Supreme Court that will choose to step down at that age and not kind of stay past the time that they need to um, because of course they're incentivized to do that. So sometimes there are ways to get around it without hitting it head on, but I think there are arguments on both sides. That question is somewhat personal to me because <laughs> I have a brother who is a U.S. District Judge in the Middle District of Georgia. They too are appointed for life. And I was his law partner when he got appointed and I remember him leaving the law office on his last day and he, looked, he turned around and looked at me and said, well, I'm gone now and I have a job I can't get fired from. And I looked at him and I was one of two lawyers left in the law firm and I said, the best I can tell, I can't get fired from this job either because much like you, I was working for myself. But 
he is a judge for life unless he's impeached by the U.S. Senate. Uh, I'm a judge until the voters of Georgia decide I can't be a judge anymore. I have to run for election every six years. And we've had many debates among brothers about which system is better. Uh, the federal judge people and supporters of the federal judge system will tell you that the Constitution's got it structured that way because the independence of our judiciary is so critically important, they don't want judges to be yielding to the latest political winds. They don't want judges to be intimidated by whatever the political movement of the day is. They don't want judges to be up there on the bench thinking about election when they're deciding the fate of people's lives, liberty, and their property. And so I think that's the reason, that's the most compelling reason people give for lifetime appointments, really the only legitimate reason, in my opinion, for lifetime appointments. And then I, on the other hand, respond that that's all well and good, but none of these positions that any public servants hold truly belongs to that person. These positions, particularly ones like mine, the position that Jen had in the state senate and the the Superior Court judges have, these positions belong to the people, and ultimately we are accountable to the people, and the people should get to decide who serves them. And at the end of the day, that holds us accountable to not going with the latest political wins in the courtroom, but doing the right thing for the right reason and following the law. So it's a good debate and an excellent question. That's a great way to end this evening. I want to thank everyone who made this event possible. Including just one moment before the clap. You know, I'm, I'm wrapping it up, I promise. All right. I want to thank the students who helped out. We have um, Catherine Cooper and Maddie Marsinkowski in the front, Savannah Biggers and Joey DeSilva were uh, checking people in. Carrie Brown helped. And finally, I want to thank our presenters to Professor Ressing, Jen Jordan, Judge Bradley, and Judge Land. If everyone will please give them a round of applause. I'm sure if you have any questions for them or you would like to meet them, they would probably be willing to stay for just a few minutes afterwards. And Chick-fil-A is available right outside the door if you would like to partake of that. Good night, everyone. <laughs>